And she did that, and often she would bite your head off. Um, Klaus Biesenbach was a German curator in Los Angeles. They were in Berlin, it was like 3 a.m. and they were eating hot dogs or something, or donor or whatever you do in Berlin. And uh, it was late. And he, he's German, you know, so he speaks excellent English, but he made a mistake in a word. And she just lost it and started ranting at him. And, you know, and she said, remember Klaus, remember, words are important. As a critic, as a curator, that's what you have. And you can never sell it and you can never give it away and you can never let yourself make these kind of mistakes. And he was just out drinking beer with her at 3 a.m. The library was my space and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. It's so funny, I actually saw that Evan Solomon interview with Susan Sontag at IFOA and she came on stage, she was before she even came on stage and Evan Solomon introduced her and he called her fierce and said that she was a very um, daunting person to interview because of her intellect and he went on like that and she came on stage and immediately started yelling at him and saying, you would not say that if I was a man, you would not call me fierce, but she was so fierce, like she was so terrifying. And I've, I've never forgotten it all these years. It was, but you, you, you seem to suggest in the biography that that is not an atypical thing for her to have done. No, um, she was fierce. I think, <laughs> I think we can say that now that she's no longer with us to, um, to counter that. Um, and she did counter it and she was often very aggressive in her public presentation. And a lot of people found this awful and really hated her for it. And other people were very inspired by it. I mean, you said you were sort of inspired by it. Yeah, you thought it was, was kind of cool. Oh yeah, it was, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a kind of majesty to this, to yeah. this um, performance of invulnerability and of power and of knowing everything and, and knowing everyone and knowing, having read every book and gone to every opera. Um, I think what's fascinating about learning about her for these seven years that I've worked on this book is just how uncertain she actually was. I mean, this was a mask for a very insecure person, a very un sure person and somebody who to a certain extent created this 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 mask of of power and invulnerability in order to disguise something that was very deep inside her and that was a a kind of insecurity that i think we all recognize because we're all insecure in certain ways and in certain times but uh, sontag grew up really without any models her mother was an alcoholic who didn't really talk to her um, her father had died in china when she was five um, she grew up in a bookless world of middle America. Um, and so she was always looking for models for how should a person be. And um, she was someone who found that often in the great female monster figures, starting with Medea and going all the way through Joan of Arc and, and Sarah Bernhard and Greta Garbo and Joan Crawford. She was a film buff and she that's sort of who she looked to in order to figure out how to how to be in the world and it was um a great self-creation um americans often thought of her as very european because she was so sophisticated and because she was someone who brought the english-speaking world news of developments that were happening in romania or germany or france um, but in fact i think that devotion to self-invention self-reinvention is is an incredibly american thing about her yeah, it's interesting um, seeing that the inside, which I guess started when her son published her diaries to see how much she created herself. And I kept having this question as I was reading the book, like that insecurity that you see in the diaries, we sort of say that's the real self and that mm. the mask is, the, is this persona and it's not as real as the person in her diaries. But for the first time reading this biography, I had this feeling like, why do we say that? Why do we say that the self, the insecure self, her perception of herself is more true than our perception of her? I couldn't agree more. I think that the, um, I think there's, if you've ever been to a great theater performance, if you've ever seen a great actress, if you've ever seen a great singer, um, Maria Callas as Norma is in some ways much more fascinating than Maria Callas washing her dishes. You know, we, we have this, 
kind of idea that the homely, normal day-to-day -day self is the real person and the public person is fake in some degree. And I don't think that Sontag's performance of what became Susan Sontag in quotes, as I say in a couple of times in, in Notes on Camp, she says, Camp is not a woman, it's a woman. Um, I think that there's something deeply authentic about it, there's something deeply moving about it, and it was absolutely influential for generations of intellectuals, particularly women, and particularly lesbians who didn't have any role models and who didn't know what it was like to see a woman eat a man alive on stage in the way that you saw. You know, this was something that she came up into a context where there were no, there was one female role model for intellectual girls, and that was Madame Curie, who, and it's funny that Carolyn Heilbrunn says this in her book, Writing a Woman's Life, that, that until 1970, there were no lives that a girl looking to study, be an academic, be a writer, be a scientist, could look to except for that one. Mm -hmm. And Sontag, you know, now we're two generations on from Sontag, and it's quite common to think there's lots of female professors and academics and, and, and writers and women in all sorts of positions of power, but there weren't when she was growing up. And even in her generation, um, already I talk about Camille Paglia sort of stalking her in the 70s, which is a funny story about how she's coming up to Vermont to visit this, to talk, and how Camille was like worrying about what to wear, and she was completely obsessed with what tone to take and what she was gonna talk about at dinner and all this stuff. And Sontag was actually only in her late 30s at that time, and she had already come to symbolize this for this younger uh, woman intellectual. So, yeah, does it matter that much that she was insecure? I mean, everybody's insecure. It's not that yeah. fascinating to a certain extent. And the performance is real, I think. And really different from what anyone else could do. A lot of people try to be grand and, and difficult. <laughs> you know, and it didn't yeah, have but, the success that well, Sontag because, did. Because they didn't yeah. have the learning that she had. Yeah. It was um, interesting. I kind of want to read you this quote um, from the, you quote this contemporary uh, cultural critic Mark Greif in your book. Yeah. And he's somebody who takes Sontag as one of his models of how to write. Right. Um, and one of the things that he said in this, I want to read it because, yeah, so, so he says, in the early Sontag, that is part of her greatness too. She is winding herself up to this position of glorious falsity and speaking through a mask. And yet there is no doubt you can hear her through the mask and that she's still just Susan. And yet the mask tells you she is not Su Susan, not now. She's the God, the God is speaking. I like that. I don't see how we yeah. atheists are going to discover anything if we don't speak as gods. Who else will the gods be? And, and that is kind of, and, and then he goes on to talk about how every other academic that he reads tries to prove that they've read everything. And right. his real question was, did she read everything or didn't she? Because in her essay, she leaves out a lot of those clues that, you know, where you try to build up your case. She just says it. You know, and yeah, you know. and she was very, uh, she told other people to do that too. She said, nobody cares about your footnotes. Right. Um, <laughs> just speak as if you know what you're talking about. And we were saying, you know, fake it till you make it. But she didn't fake it. She really, her library is unbelievable. I mean, this library is probably bigger, but not by much. I mean, she really did read everything. And it's incredible yeah. that you can pick out a book anywhere and see her notes in it. And, um, but I think that it's interesting to look at the creation of, the certainty that she projects. Um, it does come from a depth of learning that very few people had. And um, what you said about, or what he said about the voice that you hear, there's a famous thing. I mean, it's now famous in an interesting way because there was an article written about the book in The Guardian about two months ago about my discovery that she wrote her husband's first book. Yeah. Um, she was married to Philip Reef, who was an older professor whom she met and got engaged to after knowing for a week. She was 17. We sort of know how the marriage is gonna end when we hear those statistics. <laughs> but um, she was looking for someone to orient her in a world of culture, in a world of learning that she was aspiring to as a young student. And um, to make a very long story short, she writes this book. And there's all sorts of evidence for this, but I think the funny, you know, funny and least palpable form of evidence, but most convincing for me, having read all of her work so many times and being so familiar with that voice that's like always one step removed, is you, you can just tell it's her talking. And that's so funny because you can't really 
explain why it is. It's just if you know somebody's voice, you know it's hers. But she's always hiding behind a mask. And in fact, when she's writing pseudonymously in this case, um, her voice comes out even more strongly than when she's writing under her own name. So it's sort of a mystery. Hmm. What do you make of, because um, Dave Hickey reviewed the journals when they came yeah. out, and he said that David, her son, left out the most interesting things. Yeah. He left out all the books that she read, and what we want to know from Susan Sontag is like, what were all the books you read? What were yeah. all the movies you saw? And that his edit, I mean, you're probably the only other person who read all her journals. You read 100 journals. Like, 100 what, would you, what would you make of his edit of? Well, he's absolutely right in a certain way. I mean, if you look at the journals in the, archive and you actually open them and I had it on my computer I had the the FSG version of the journals as they were published and if you look at them the the elisions and deletions are very subtle they're not huge chunks that are gone but they're very little pieces that are gone and so you see a, a sort of self-presentation of a self-presentation of a self-presentation and it gets very complicated I think Sontag was a great maker of lists. And so I do understand the editorial decision to um, omit some of those lists because sometimes she will put a list of 500 words or something that she's learning that week. And um, you think, do you really need to publish all these? Or, or, I mean, Dave Hickey's criticism of that I think was really interesting, but I can also see just from an editorial perspective that you would think, do we need 43 pages of like brands of soap or whatever? Right. I mean, Sontag loved lists and a lot of her great Essays are lists, and Notes on Camp is a list, for example, of what she is not saying, but is saying is the, the gay sensibility. Um, how, can you, how can you tell someone's gay? It's kind of funny. It's like, how can you tell she wrote this book? Because you can just yeah. kind of tell. Yeah. But once you say, oh, well, I can tell you're gay, you, got, you can't really define it. You can just, as soon as you start talking about that, you fall into stereotypes and you fall into cliches and, and it offends people. And yet, at the same time, there is something there. And the lists that she keeps are her signposts. And I love them. I mean, I absolutely, one of the things I did, you should all Google this if you feel like 500 hours of cultural improvement. Um, <laughs> there's a list of her favorite films in The New Yorker. It's a list of 50 great films. And I had never seen these films, actually. I mean, a few of them here and there you've seen because you've been out in the world. But actually, you know, Sontag, if you look at the cover of the book, you know, I mean, she looks so contemporary. But actually, this picture is 50 years old. And so when you're writing about her, you're often writing about concepts that have really, really changed and that are not even comprehensible. Like when you talk about gay people, you have to realize that when she was growing up, gay people did not exist. They were absolutely invisible and they were not spoken of in most of the world, including in the places where you would think, you know, Toronto or Los Angeles, totally invisible and often illegal. So when you're trying to figure out her own sensibility, these lists are a real guide. So I watched all these 50 movies, her top 50 movies. And some of them are really, for me, with my background and my being from a different generation, I really couldn't quite enter into them and I couldn't really understand them. But a lot of them were so fantastic and so great. And one of the fun things about Sontag and about reading her and reading about her is that you can educate yourself in a way that I don't think there's another modern writer that gives you the key to culture in the sense that she does. Mm -hmm. I mean, she gives you a key to film, literature, politics, sexuality, dance, music, um, different countries and their literatures. I mean, it's an unbelievable range of stuff. And so I do like those lists because they, I found them just really one of the most interesting things about her. Yeah, the, one of the things that I felt reading your biography was a kind, you know, she talks about uh, I'm drinking from a thousand straws or I'm yeah. sipping from a thousand straws. Yeah. This, the nights that she would go out, she would see you know four movies in a day, or she would go to four openings, and it was just this insatiable desire to like take in culture. You know, she hated the fact that she had to sleep. There was just, but it makes it made me nauseous, like yeah. how much she took in. It was just like you know an all you can eat buffet, and like, and my 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 when I was thinking because one of obviously one of the struggles. Um, for her was that she wanted to be a great artist or a great novelist and what she was was a great critic. And, and, and that reading the book, that 
the fact that she took in so much art, that was the real evidence for me of the difference between the critic and the artist, because most artists I know are really selective about what they can take in. Mm. And it's like, you have to preserve a certain amount of silence in your head and a certain amount of like space in order for the imagination to do its work. And maybe you can read one book or see one movie, but you can't see 50 movies you know, in a month and also make work, it seems to me. No, well, she did. I mean, it's amazing that she did. It's amazing that she did anything, considering how many books she read and how many films she saw. But I mean, imaginative work. It's very hard. I mean, I think that, you know, she was absolutely, someone says, I quote in the book, that she said to him, they were in a Chinese restaurant, and she said, I would rather live with any person in this room picked out at random than live by myself. And she did not like to be alone, and she was actually quite scared of it. And at the same time, culturally, it was a similar thing. I think that she's very interested in the critic as artist. And the critic as artist is something that we've sort of forgotten about because we think that creative work, as she did, you know, you have poetry and you have fiction and that's sort of better than nonfiction or, or history or biography. But in fact, she came from a world intellectually that was basically a Freudian world in which the interpreter is actually superior to the creator. Because in, in Freudianism, in psychoanalysis, the creator doesn't actually really know what he or she is doing. Or they think they're doing one thing, but actually, you know, the cigar is not really a cigar. And uh, so, you know, there's always this question of what is really going on. And that, I think, is really fascinating. It's something we've kind of lost sight of. At the same time, she did have this discontent with her own creation, which I find quite sad as her, mm -hmm. as her, I hope her champion and her representative, since she's no longer with us to a certain extent, I can talk about her and I can hope that people will go to her work. Um, she is someone who is unhappy with her achievement because she does absorb this idea. And I just sort of want her to like her work more and, and she's very unhappy with it. And, and, um, Actually, we were talking about this earlier, when she would leave the United States, and this was in the days before the internet, she was much less guarded in her interviews when mm -hmm. she would come abroad than when she was at home, where she had this very tight performance of herself. And one of the very funny interviews that she did was in Toronto, and it's funny that now Toronto to New York is not, there's no difference because it's on the internet. And somebody would tweet it, and it wouldn't matter where it was published. But you know, this was 20 years ago, and she starts talking about how terrible her, her essays are and how it's so outmoded, and what she really is doing is, 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 is writing fiction, and this is her real vocation. Um, and she expresses it much more um, affirmatively than she would have done in the United States, rubbishing her old work. But there's always that discontent, and you, I mean, it's kind of, you, you live with someone for seven years, night and day, and you're always, and you're going through their lives with them, and you see them making mistakes, you know, you think like, oh God, like don't sleep with her. Like that's gonna be a disaster, <laughs> you know? Cause you know what's gonna happen and she doesn't know what's gonna happen. So it's sort of unfair in that sense. But um, one of the things that I like, I, I just, I wish she had been more happy with her own achievement because it was a great achievement and it did inspire so many people. Well, would you say, cause you also wrote a biography of Clarice Lispector, was she happy with her achievement? Is anyone happy? Yes. She was? Fascinatingly, I knew Clarice Lispector's sister, um, who if anyone here has a Jewish grandmother, like we do, <laughs> this woman, it was so funny because my grandmother was from Texas and um, I just thought she was my grandmother. And then I, I met Tanya, Clarice's sister, and she was like the Brazilian second printing of my grandmother. It was so funny. I would, it makes sense, of course, you know, they all sort of came ultimately from a similar culture and similar places in Eastern Europe. And I, um, and she was very sweet and she was very, um, she always wanted me to have another Diet Coke and she was always like serving me cake and the maid was always coming in and she was like fretting about like, you don't look so healthy, you know, like, are you sure you're eating enough and all that kind of stuff that if you have a Jewish grandmother you're familiar with. But um, she was, so she was sort of a, a nice grandma person, but I said to her, I asked her this question, I said, do you think Clarice knew what she had done? And her face changed completely. And she said she knew perfectly well that she had left an unequaled heritage to this nation. And it was this silence in the, 
I, I was absolutely, she was very vehement about this. And so that made me very happy because I thought that was a very suffering life as well. Um, but she knew that she had done something. She died at 56. Um, and she would have done more, but she did know what she had done. I don't think Sontag ever knew. There's a story in the book where she's dying in the hospital. She's had this transplant, and her agent comes in, and he said, oh, I'm sorry to disturb you if you were asleep. And she's, no, I'm not asleep. I'm not asleep. I'm working. I'm working. And she was dreaming, you know, in this delirium, at the dying about working and, and not having lived up to what she wanted to be. And I find that heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I'm curious because what's it like to, how do your feelings change? So you spend seven years with her. You, the Clarice Lispector biography, that was your passion project. Mm -hmm. You fell in love with her work and you wanted to write it. This was a given to you. Mm -hmm. What, what's the difference between writing about somebody that you come to with love and Versus, I don't know how, how you came to Sontag, like what, what your feelings about her were before you got the commission, but what were they? And then how did they change over the seven years of, of working on it? And how do you even start yeah. a, a biography, this, you know, of somebody like Susan Sontag? I still don't know, to be honest. I can't believe I actually wrote this book because it's <laughs> so complicated and it's just so massive, the subject. And I mean, I had come to Clarice out of my own interests and um, I was fascinated by this world of the great female intellectuals. I thought there was a lot to be excited about there. I thought there was a lot that was not being said about it. And I really got this feeling the more I got into Clarice's life and that you know, that was in Brazil, it was a different culture, but actually um, the position of women, and we're not talking about Saudi Arabia, but you know, we're talking about Western countries, um, Europe and North America and Latin America. It was actually more similar than it was different. And um, I thought there was a lot to be excited about there, and I thought there was a lot to be shocked by there, too. I was really shocked by it. Um, and I think you'll read in the book, if you do, there's a lot of stuff that is really hard for us to take on board right now, um, two or three generations later. My love for Clarice, though, like I had, that was a very deep, it still is a very deep emotion in my soul. And um, I didn't think I could do it again, because it was such a, it was like marrying somebody. Um, and then I was offered the opportunity to have this access to her archives and to all this stuff. And because I was interested in, maybe I was interested in women writers in general, um, I, I jumped at it. I mean, it was a huge honor, you know, as an American to be asked to write about Susan Sontag is a really big honor and it's a really big responsibility. Um, I had read her, I hadn't read, it's so weird because at the end, what I know about Susan Sontag is so much that I actually probably know more about Susan Sontag than she did in a certain way because when you, I was going through some old emails because I was re, I was switching email accounts and sort of moving some emails. I see stuff that I wrote, you know, in 2013. I don't even know who the person is. I don't remember what this is all about. Like I can kind of go through the chain and remember it, but you know, we live our lives forward and the biographer looks backward, and I don't remember necessarily, you know, what I might have said to somebody when I was 12 years old. Um, but if somebody has a record of that, then the biographer sees that. And so it's sort of an unfair position because you're also um, talking to someone who not only is not alive and can't talk back to you, but somebody who, even if she were alive, wouldn't necessarily even know what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. you know, because she wouldn't remember. And it's astonishing just going through these emails how much I've forgotten from just a few years ago. Um, and my, no my knowledge of Sontag now compared to what it was when I started, I mean, I had read on photography, I had read against interpretation, I had read on this metaphor, I think in college. And I think like so many people, um, I mean, if you go into a bookstore and you see even the authors you've read and liked, but haven't read all their work and don't really know that much about, but thought, oh, um, I should go back and read that. We were talking about Margaret Atwood last night. I interviewed her once in Texas, um, and I had read a few of her books. And it turns out she's written like 50 books or something, and when you interview her, you're like, oh, do I have to read all this? And it's completely <laughs> different. Um, and when you do that, somebody else emerges from the person that you would have known if you had read two books. Mm -hmm. So I loved the opportunity because it's so rewarding to go that deep into somebody's work. It's so exciting and it's just so, you can't do it for everyone. Maybe Sontag probably would have done it for everyone. She probably would have read the complete works of every 
author. But um, for those of us who do sleep, you know, <laughs> um, it's hard and it's really exciting to get to know a person this way. And do you, okay, here's something. Chris Krauss um, blurbed the book and she said that the book describes the extents and limits of her genius. Can you talk, having read everything she's written, what the extents and limits are of her genius? Well, the extents are what we've been talking about. This woman who had written about, in some form or another, just about every theme that I think is, is essential to modern society. Um, I guess she doesn't really write about economics. It's interesting. She doesn't really write about race. Um, but pretty much everything else, it's all in there. And it's fascinating to see it all unfold. And I think that the limits are basically self-imposed by uh, self discontent that she has. Um, a, and, and some of that, if, if not most of that, I think comes from her uh, sexuality. I mean, she's gay in a time when people are not allowed to be gay. Her child was almost taken away from her because she was gay. Um, this was, you know, people lost their jobs, they lost their homes, they lost their, their livelihoods and their, their lives. I mean, still today, gay kids kill themselves more than straight kids by a large degree. And so we're talking about a time when this was very dangerous. Um, I think that her inability to say I, and this is the feminist critique that emerges in the 70s, that you can't say the body. This is Adrian Rich saying this. It's not the body, it's my body. That you're supposed to speak from your experience, and this is something that limits the temptation to grandiosity in terms, it, it limits the, the uses of allegory and metaphor, which is something Sontag's profoundly interested in. Um, I think that when the winds shifted in the 80s with AIDS, um, she was unable to come along with that for all sorts of reasons that I completely understand. Um, I mean, I'm a gay person myself, and I know that not, it's not always easy um, for a lot of people to, to be gay, whether even if they don't come from repressive religious backgrounds or um, hateful families, which a lot of people do, um, there are all these obstacles. And I do think when you start looking at her relationships, which are consistently unhappy uh, and often very abusive, she, um, her energy, a lot of energy that I wish, again, looking back and kind of knowing how it's gonna end, is, it's a position that's unfair to her. But, um, but I do know how these end. Um, I just wish that she could have been a little bit happier in her personal life and less fraught, and I think that the peace that that might have brought her would have brought a different kind of writing forth. But at the same time, I like that her writing is so tense. It's mm -hmm. coiled, you know, it's like ready to pounce, like she pounced on that interviewer. Um, it's kind of exciting to see where she's gonna go next. And I think that like a calm, tranquil, peaceful person would have been a completely different person. So I'm pretty much in favor of letting people be who they wanna be and, and making the mistakes that we all make, but in our own special ways. Yeah. I'm interested also, well, you, you were talking about her relationships and her friendships, yeah. um, and especially in her friendships with younger writers and how she was sort of a critic of them and telling them what to read. And one of my favorite anecdotes from the book is um, her friendship with uh, the interviewer, Michael Silverblatt. Mm -hmm. um, and she tells him that he has to throw out his toys. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> yeah, like I guess he collected toys. And she's he like, you allergic. have to grow up and... Yeah, he had been allergic to dust when he was a little boy. And his parents one day, because of this, threw away all his stuffed animals, which is so sad, you know. Um, he comes home from school and they're all gone. So anyway, he grows up, years pass, and he's a grown up and he can collect stuffed animals again. So he's, he collects all these toys and stuff. And Susan just came in and she said, I'm not angry with you, but it's gotta stop. <laughs> he was throwing them away. And he said, it sounds so simple, but it really helped him. He said it really made me, it gave me some peace with my childhood and it gave me an ability to move on and, and, and become a grown up. And she did that and often she would bite your head off. Um, Klaus Biesenbach, who's a German curator in Los Angeles, they were in Berlin, it was like 3 a.m. and they were eating hot dogs or something or donor or whatever you eat in Berlin and um, it was late. And he, he's German, you know, so he speaks excellent English, but he made a mistake in a word and she just lost it and started ranting at him and you know, and she said, remember Klaus, remember, words are important. As a critic, as a curator, that's what you have and you can never sell it and you can never give it away and you can never 
let yourself make these kind of mistakes. And he was just out drinking beer with her at 3 a.m., you know. <laughs> and he said he never forgot it because it was mm -hmm. such a valuable lesson. You know, when you're a curator, that's what you have, is your taste and your learning and your personality that you bring to this. And you can't always be looking left and looking right and second guessing yourself. And she gave him this thing that, you know, this is now 25 years on and he's the head of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles and a very important guy. Um, and that's his, you know, that's his leading, what do you call it, his leading star. I mean, he always remembers that when he's doing these things. Like, you can't put the work in the show just because it's some donor, you know, or, or because he, he that, that's guided him through his life and his career. Can you also talk about um, uh, Susan Sontag in Sarajevo and putting yeah. on, I, I mean, she put on um, uh, Waiting for Godot, but what I'm interested in is the way that people talk about her in Sarajevo is so different from the way that yeah. people talk about her in New York. And how, I'm interested in the idea, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but that we're not only who we are, but that the place makes a person. And somehow she could be a different person in Sarajevo than she was in New York City. And it sounds like when I read the book, like two yeah. different people are being described. Well, they're not. You know, it's so funny is Susan, when I met her friend Meryl Roden, who is um, the friend that she writes about that she goes to visit Thomas Mann with in a famous short story when they're in uh, college. And they had a game about Igor Stravinsky, who was still alive, living in California at the time. How many years of their lives were they, how many years could they give Stravinsky in exchange for falling dead there on the spot? And they figured out, they said like, you know, six years. Anyway, they, they figured out it was for four years for Stravinsky, they were willing to die. Right then and there, just fall flat dead on the ground. Um, and that sounds kind of cute and funny and like nerdy high school kids. But um, in fact, she really did believe that art and culture were worth dying for. And all her life she did. And she goes to Sarajevo, she puts on this play in a city where there were no birds because all the birds had fled. Um, in a city where people walked around with their shit in paper bags because they couldn't, they couldn't flush their toilets. And so you would shit in a paper bag and then like walk through the city and try to find somewhere to dispose of it. Um, where 10, you know, 10,000 people are murdered, where people are being rounded up and put in concentration camps in full view of CNN and the rest of the world and all these countries that could have done something. And they're sat sitting around just living their lives. And this was an hour from Vienna. It's an hour from Venice. Um, and th in that place, she found that that little girl who wanted to die for Stravinsky found as an old woman at the end of her life a usefulness for culture. And she goes and she thinks, these people, they need NATO to come bomb the Serbian positions. But they also need to be treated as human beings and what it means to be a human being is to go to a play and read a book. And, and she, um, the meaningfulness that she brought to the, to this day, I was, I was in this marketplace, which is still under a, a, a freeway um, overpass bridge in the middle of the city. It's still there because that's where it moved during the city, during the siege, because you wouldn't get murdered while you were shopping for your vegetables. You would, you know, you had this protection and she goes um, she goes to Sarajevo and, you know, she's this figure that is associated with elite culture. I mean, I'm sure for Canadians, for Americans, like for Europeans, she's associated with very difficult forms of modern art. But I was curious about, and I asked this woman at this marketplace, I had a translator and I said, ask that woman. She was like, she was like the most normal looking woman I could find. She was selling meat and she had like a smock with blood on it. It was sort of symbolic now that I think about it. <laughs> um, and I said, do you know who Susan Sontag was? Well, this woman was completely outraged that I would think she wouldn't know who Susan Sontag was. And um, she said, of course, everybody knows, we absolutely, you know, we venerate her, we admire her. She came here when nobody believed us, nobody was listening to us. They were letting us get packed off to concentration camps in full view of everybody. Nobody cared about our lives. It was like we were scum. And she came and she sat with us and she lived with us and she lived alongside us and she listened to us and she gave us a voice. And, blah, 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 this whole speech. And, you know, she would write against interpretation. I mean, it was really funny because you see how meaningful Susan had been to this whole city um, that named the square around the National Theater after her. And 
you know, so I think that I always thought of her. It's funny when people in New York would complain about her and stuff. And, you know, she was a difficult lady, but like she, uh, I, th I always thought about the woman in Sarajevo um, in the market. And I thought, you know what, you'll get over this. You know, these people like at the New York Times or whatever, <laughs> you know, you'll move on. But what she, I really think that's her legacy is showing that culture is something that, that's worth dying for.